Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is 2024 presidential contender Larry Elder. Larry, thanks for coming on. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course, last time we talked, which was a month ago back in August, you were filing an FEC complaint against the RNC after they kept you off the debate stage for not meeting their qualifications. Can you first give us an update? What's going on there? Well, not only did they keep me off the debate stage, Brittany, they put a sign at the door and told security that if Elder shows up or if his campaign team shows up, don't let him in. I met the RNC debate criteria. They required me to have 40,000 individual donors, I did to submit three polls where I was at 1% or better, and I did. As soon as I did that, I get a phone call after the deadline from Ronna McDaniel, and she says, you can't use one of the polls because it's the Rasmussen poll, and it, quote, is affiliated with Donald Trump, close quote. And I said, assuming that's true, why is it my problem? And she said, well, the rules stipulate that any uh, campaign that's affiliated with a poll, that poll can't be used by anybody else in the campaign. Well, Rasmussen put out a statement and said, Donald Trump is not affiliated with our poll. So Brittany, even if before I submitted the poll, I had picked up the phone and called Rasmussen and said, by the way, just want to make sure you're not affiliated with Trump. They would have said, no, uh, we're not. Please go ahead and submit our poll. And I still would have been ruled ineligible. Furthermore, Rasmussen said that before they even conducted their poll, they contacted the RNC to make sure they were following their sample size criteria. And the RNC never said, oh, by the way, you guys are not eligible. So it seems to me I got shafted, let's put it that way. So my lawyer is the uh, former chairman of the Federal Election Commission, and he says that because Elder uh, did not have the debate criteria fairly applied to him, what the RNC did, in essence, uh, is to give an in-kind contribution to the eight people who were on that debate stage that would, would possibly uh, the RNC to a fine of up to $100 million. Now, the goal, of course, was to make the next debate, which is a uh, tomorrow here in California at the Ronald Reagan Library. Uh, and by six o'clock yesterday, I had to have three polls where I was at 3% or better. I did not, so therefore I won't be attending that debate. But had I made the first debate, but been able to talk about my father, uh, who never knew his biological father, clean toilets when I was growing up, talked about the epidemic of fatherlessness, the lie that America remains systemically racist, a need for an amendment to the Constitution to fix spending to a certain percentage of the GDP, uh, and a much more full-throated denunciation of the lies Democrats push that America remains systemically racist. In my humble opinion, Brittany, if people see me do my thing, I would not have had any difficulty making the criteria for the debate tomorrow. But that didn't happen. You said last time we talked that you believe the RNC is rigged. You said the fix is in. How has the RNC responded, if at all? Well, they put out a letter after, after I said that to the other RNC members and said Elder didn't even qualify uh, in three polls at 1% or more. Uh, after telling me that I did qualify uh, with two of them, the third one was not, uh, was not usable. So I put out a letter uh, to the RNC members linking all the polls where I qualified, showing that the RNC did not tell the truth when they said that I did not meet the criteria for the three one for three and one percent. I have no idea why they're why they're doing this. In my opinion, I believe I make them feel uncomfortable. I think I give them heartburn, for example. I think that regarding the, the budget uh, that we're looking at right now, possible shutdown of government, the Republicans are approaching the a problem uh, with a pocket knife that requires a machete. By that I mean this, we need deep, deep cuts and we need major structural reform in the so-called entitlements. Even Bill Clinton one time set up a commission to look at Social Security uh, and both he and Barack Obama referred to the entitlements as unsustainable. Yet we're doing anything about that. And I talked about earlier with you a moment, moment ago about the amendment to fix spending to a certain percentage of the GDP. And regarding race, here's what the Democrats do. The country is 50-50. What they do, however, is can try to convince 13% of the electorate, meaning black voters, that America remains systemically racist. And we, by the way, are the good guys in the fight for social justice. And these Republicans are the bad guys. It is a lie that's dividing the country. It's also getting people killed. It's called the Ferguson effect or the George Floyd effect. And that's a phenomenon Brittany, of cops pulling back all over the country for fear of being accused of engaging in systemic racism. As a result, there are thousands of people who are dead who otherwise would not have been dead if the police had been doing their normal practice policing. Now, Republicans tiptoe around things like this. When Biden goes, for example, to Howard University, and I'll shut up after this, goes to Howard University and says the number one threat to the homeland uh, is white supremacy. Uh, we did not denounce that. Uh, it's a lie. Most homicide is same race homicide. Most whites who are killed are killed by other whites. 
most blacks were killed or killed by other blacks. However, every year, there are roughly 750, a small percentage of all the homicides that are between blacks and whites. 500 white people are killed uh, by blacks, 250 black people are killed by whites, even though whites are 60% of the population. Now, if Donald Trump, uh, at a commencement exercise, said the number one threat to the homeland was black supremacy, you and I would denounce Donald Trump as a race-hustling demagogue, and should. But Biden says it, and the RNC doesn't say a damn thing. These are the kinds of thing that, things that Elder says that I believe gives the, the, uh, the uh, GOP leadership heartburn. I do want to get to the issues, and I also do want to get to the debate, but I do want to ask you first, what do you think then is the number one threat to the United States? Uh, the number one domestic issue uh, is obviously the economy, uh, inflation, uh, gas prices, uh, and, and borders. But the number one social problem facing America is what I call the epidemic of fatherlessness. It is particularly acute in the black community where 70% of black kids up in 25% back in 1965, into the world without a father in the home, married to the mother. And the stats are clear. If you're raised without a father, you're five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in jail. What we've done with the so-called war on poverty that was launched in the mid-60s by a Democrat named Lyndon Johnson is to incentivize women to marry the government and incentivize men to abandon the financial and moral responsibility. And neither side is talking about this. The left doesn't talk about it because they created the problem. Our side doesn't talk about it for fear that if you're white, you'll be accused of engaging in, in systemic racism. And if you're called, as I was called by the LA Times, the black face of white supremacy. So the number one uh, social issue facing America is not talked about by either Democrats or Republicans. A new ABC Washington Post poll dove into the top issues facing voters and Americans in general. You touched on one of them, that being the economy. According to this poll, 74% of Americans say the economy is not so good or poor. That's a huge amount of the country. That's almost three quarters of the country. So as a president right. elder, what would you do to inspire confidence in the economy again? Stop the spending. Stop paying people not to work. It's war on oil and gas build a pipeline, um, reduce taxes, reduce regulations, do the kinds of things that Donald Trump did. They gave us arguably the best economy uh, in American history. And how would you differ from Donald Trump then? You're saying he gave us the best economy. Why should voters pick Larry Elder over Donald Trump? Well, uh, I'm not running against Donald Trump, I'm running against Biden Harris. Uh, but uh, what I bring to the table is what I said earlier. Republicans are taking a pocket knife to a problem that requires a machete. Uh, and, and the machete is necessary to get government down to the size it ought to be. The founding fathers intended for the limited duties and obligations of the federal government uh, to be uh, paid for with duties and tariffs. Now, we, we take almost 32% from the American people, federal, state, and local, whereas in 1900, we took about 9% federal, state, and local from the American people. We're taking way too much money from the American people, and as a result, our economy is not growing nearly as fast as it would otherwise would grow. You get the government down to the size uh, it should be, leave as much money in the pockets of the American people as possible, and the economy will soar. What does your machete here look like? What are you cutting that Republicans, you're saying right now, are too afraid to? Well, the amendment that I would propose would fix spending to a certain percentage of the GDP. I would argue maybe 10%. Right now, it's around 22%, which require a lot of deep cuts uh, and a lot of major changes in some of the uh, programs, for example. Bill Clinton once set up a commission to deal with uh, the fact that Social Security right now uh, is spending more than it's taking in. He recommended three things, either changing the eligibility age or requiring a greater number of uh, people to a, great, a higher percentage of contributions uh, or to get a greater return by allowing people to invest part of their money <clears throat> excuse me, in instruments like, like the stock market. Yet nothing was done. So these are some of the kinds of things that uh, the politicians would have to do if you force them to cut spending to a certain percentage of the GDP. Otherwise, it could not run for re-election. It's amazing how creative people can get uh, when they have no option but to cut. Uh, and that's what the amendment to the Constitution would force them to do. I'm sure this issue will come up tomorrow night regarding immigration. It came up in that Washington Post ABC poll, 62% of Americans disapprove of President Biden's handling of the situation at the southern border. Once again, that's a pretty big number. Under an elder presidency, what are you doing to fix it? Put back the Trump policies, uh, put back Remain in Mexico, stop catch and release, 
finish the wall. Uh, and more importantly, send a signal that you are not welcome to come into the country illegally. Joe Biden completely changed that uh, with, with his attitude during one of the debates. He said, if I become president, there'll be a quote, surge on the border, close quote. And shortly after Joe Biden got elected, Martha Raddatz Ratt of uh, ABC News goes to the border and she interviews this guy. And she said to him, would you be trying this if Donald Trump had been reelected? He said, absolutely not. Joe Biden has, quote, given us permiso, meaning Joe Biden is giving us permission to come. So simply sending a signal to the rest of the world that if you come to the country illegally, you will not be allowed to enter, you will not be allowed to stay, changes behavior. As you know, when President Trump was president, he did try to build a border wall that didn't come to fruition fully. And that was really a lightning rod issue. That was a non-starter for a lot of Democrats. How do you get Democrats on board when it comes to this issue? I'm not sure you will be able to get Democrats on board when it comes to this issue. But he was building the wall. Uh, the wall was stopped when Joe Biden came in. So there's a lot of things the president can do, uh, whether or not uh, at, the, at this level uh, you've got buy-in from Democrats. I'm sure that uh, there are lots of issues that you're not going to get buy-in from Democrats on, and the border is, is one of them. So what? Does the president have the power to build the, the border? Uh, could he use money from, for example, uh, the Defense Department to argue that it's, that it's necessary for national security? The answer is yes. I do now want to switch gears a little bit and talk about an issue that has really been prevalent in recent months, and that's the age of a lot of politicians. If elected, Biden would be 80, or re-elected rather, Biden would be 82 in January 2025, and Trump would be 78. And according to, once again, that ABC Washington Post poll, 74% of adults believe that President Biden is too old to serve again, and 50% of Americans echo those sentiments regarding former President Trump. Do you think there needs to be a discussion when it comes to age limits? I really don't. Um, Biden's age is less of a concern to me than Biden policies on borders, on inflation, on oil and gas, on people paying people not to work, on, on putting pressure on states in order to shut down their states because of COVID. I'm far more concerned about bad policy than I am about Joe Biden's age. That said, it seems to me that, that he clearly has some cognitive issues. I don't think anybody feels that way about Donald Trump. This is a guy who stands up and gives a two-hour two uh, uh, a talk, uh, attracting 10, 20, 30,000 people. Biden couldn't do that in a million years. And so I'm far more concerned about uh, policies uh, and about whether or not uh, Biden is, is up for the job. And the more I look at it, the more I don't think he is. Uh, but that said, if he can fall up a mirror based upon how the politics are cutting right now, he's going to be the nominee. And if he's not the nominee, Kamala Harris is going to be the nominee. You said earlier in this conversation that at the first debate a month ago, you said there was a sign that barred you from the entire venue of the debate. I saw that that was reported as well. I wasn't there, but that did circulate online. And as we know, you're in California. The debate is also in California. Will you be showing up to the venue? Uh, I don't know. I think I read that there are like 50 seats uh, that are available. Uh, and most of them are giving out to people who are connected. Uh, I don't know whether or not I'm going to uh, going to go. I haven't made a decision yet. Uh, I'm not really sure that it matters. I certainly intend to watch the debate, and I'll be asked to comment on it, so I'll be prepared to do that. And um, during last month's debate, there were a wide array of topics covered, everything from the immigration to the economy, which we just covered, China, everything in between. What question do you think needs to be answered or asked, and what do you think is missing from the conservative conversation when it comes to the presidential election? Well, uh, at the first debate, I was very disappointed to hear Chris Christie refer to Donald Trump as an insurrectionist. And it seems to me all other Republicans out there should have responded forcefully against that. Uh, what Donald Trump did the first week of January to make the same argument that the vice president has more than ceremonial powers and could reject certain states. Same argument that Democrats made after the 2000 election uh, when about a dozen House members of gentrification of Florida. The same argument Democrats made in 2004 when George W. Bush got reelected and about 30 House members, including Barbara Boxer, Senator, uh, joined together to try to prevent the certification of, uh, of Ohio, claiming that the depot of voting machines uh, had been tampered with, where we heard that. Uh, and following the 2016 election that Donald Trump won, uh, Democrats the first week of January uh, in 2017 challenged more states, nine, 
uh, than Donald Trump did after the 2020 election when he challenged six. Yet nobody referred to them as election deniers. Nobody prosecuted them, and their lawyers were not facing disbarment. There's a two-tiered system of justice, which I think needs to be much more soundly attacked uh, by Republicans than Republicans are attacking right now. At that debate, there was a moment where former Vice President Mike Pence looked around the stage and asked the contenders up there if they believed he did the right thing on January 6th. What would you have said if you were on the stage then and he asked you that? I would have said he did the right thing on January 6th. He interpreted the Electoral Count Act the way it has historically been interpreted. But as I said earlier, I have no problem with Donald Trump making the same argument Democrats balanced in 2004 and 2016. Uh, when they made it, nobody accused him of assaulting the Constitution, of undermining our republic. But Donald Trump does it. He's accused that way. It's just not fair. You want to be on the debate stage, I'm assuming tomorrow night but donald trump he qualified for the debate he's not going and instead he's going to detroit to talk to the auto workers who are on strike there what do you make of that decision well donald trump has a commanding lead politics 101 you generally don't debate when you have a lead that commanding when i ran for governor uh, there were several gop debates i did not participate in any of them i was a front runner far and away uh, and I said over and over again in the interviews, the issue is not my fellow Republican replacement candidates. The issue is Gavin Newsom. Similarly, the issue is Biden-Harris. We cannot afford to have four more years of Biden-Harris. And so whoever our nominee is, uh, he or she should be backed by Republicans to make sure we don't have the same kind of thing. So I have no problem with Donald Trump not having gone to the debate. I'd be one of the biggest hypocrites in the world if I criticized him for not debating when I didn't debate my fellow Republican challenges. I say to the media over and over again, the debate I want to have is with Gavin Newsom. Put pressure on Gavin Newsom. And don't you find it interesting, after the uh, California recall debate uh, is over, now Gavin Newsom is debating uh, Ron DeSantis when it doesn't matter. It, it mattered during the recall election, but nobody in the media put pressure on, on Gavin Newsom to debate me, even though I called him out many times. I do want to talk about your pathway to victory here. Earlier in the conversation, you did say you didn't qualify for Wednesday's debate. What does that pathway of victory for you look like? Well, it's obviously much more difficult if I didn't make the first debate uh, to get my numbers up to 3%, which was a threshold for the second debate. Uh, and I'm not, not going to make the second debate. So millions, millions of people did not hear the story about my father, did not hear the, the issues that I wanted to talk about. As I said earlier, the epidemic of fatherlessness, the lie that America remains systemically racist, uh, and the crucial need for school choice. I know that Republicans support school choice, Brittany, but we don't talk enough about how bad it is K-12 in urban America, where, for example, in Baltimore, there are 13 public high schools where 0% of the kids can do math at grade level. So those are the kinds of things that I would have been talking about. I'm not going to be talking about, so the pathway is going to be far more difficult. By the way, I've outlined what happens to the, to the uh, country if uh, the country follows the same pathway that we follow here in California. We've had a single party state, Democrats, dominating the state for decades. My book is called As Goes California, My Mission to Rescue the Golden State and Save the Nation. It comes out the first week of November. So go to Barnes and Noble and uh, uh, Amazon and order your copy now. Larry Elder, I really appreciate the time you took today. Best of luck and you're welcome back anytime. And please tell people to go to LarryElder.com, throw something in the tip jar because I've incurred unexpected legal expenses by having to go after the RNC for failing to allow me to make that first debate. So LarryElder.com, I appreciate your time, Rick. God bless.